Good evening. Before I begin, I'd like to thank the Lannan Foundation for their just spectacular uh, hospitality. I came all the way here from New Hampshire and they were kind enough to bring my weather <laughs> with me. It's a good feeling. I would also like to take a moment and thank my great friend and coworker Dar Jamail for inviting me here to speak about one of my very favorite topics, my friend and coworker Dar Jamail. <laughs> but first I would like to begin with a brief quotation from an unheeded prophet. As crude a weapon as the caveman's club, the chemical barrage has been hurled against the fabric of life. A fabric on the one hand delicate and destructible, <clears throat> on the other hand miraculously tough, resilient, and capable of striking back in unexpected ways. Those words, warning of ecological collapse if the rampant pollution of our, of our environment continued unchecked, were written 57 years ago by Rachel Carson in her revolutionary book, Silent Spring. <laughs> Novelist C.P. Snow, writing a foreword to the 25th anniversary reprint of Silent Spring, said that Carson had, quote, succeeded in making a book about death, a celebration of life. Nearly six decades later, here we are, gathered in contemplation of another book about death that, like Silent Spring, is also a celebration of life. Like Cassandra of old, Rachel Carson's warnings were not heeded. I believe she would recognize Dar Jamail as a kindred spirit on sight. I first met Dar more than 10 years ago when we were trying to stop a war, but I've been very much aware of his work long before that. Back in 2003, you will recall the media coverage of the Iraq war was appallingly fawning, one-sided, and riddled with officially sanctioned lies. Dar got fed up with the lies we were being fed and did something remarkable. He packed a bag and he went to Iraq on his own hook, unembedded and unprotected. For eight months, between 2003 and 2005, Dar was in the war zone during probably the darkest period of that war. I could give you a hundred examples of the information about that war I learned from Dar and Dar alone one example, however, stands out. When General Jim Mad Dog Mattis was appointed Defense Secretary by Donald Trump, the news media breathed a sigh of relief. Thank goodness, there's an adult in the administration. Dar was appalled by the appointment because he saw with his own eyes what General Mad Dog, the horrors visited upon the city of Fallujah. You didn't hear about it in the news, but I know what happened because Dar told me. In the intervening years, Dar's attention has become fixed on the actual emergency of anthropogenic climate change. As with his Iraq coverage, he was not content to merely read the work of experts and talk to people in the know. An avid naturalist, Dar felt as if a beloved friend was deathly ill, and he intended to stand by the sickbed and bear witness to the ravages for himself, and so he did. Dar traveled the world to see for himself what was happening. During the period he was writing this book, I would sometimes ask our boss at Truth Out Maya where Dar was. Oh, he's camping on a glacier for a month. Okay then. The chronicle of his journey, The End of Ice, is a harrowing read. Each chapter a love letter and a wake for places of unique and exquisite beauty that will soon be either gone entirely or changed drastically. We are all in this book, right here and now. It is the story of our lives. Darjumail is not here to make you smile or to hold your hand and say everything will be okay. I will leave it to him to explain it, but the short version is starkly simple. The avalanche has already begun, and it is far too late for the rocks to make up their minds. This is happening. This has already happened. And yet, and yet Rachel Carson also wrote, one way to open your eyes to unnoticed beauty is to ask yourself, what if I had never seen this before? What if I knew I would never see it again? 
That is why Dar Jamal wrote this book and why he's here with us today. Like so many people, he wrote in his conclusion, I've wondered what to do at this time. From this moment on, knowing what is happening to the planet, to what do I devote my life? Devoted to beauty, devoted to truth, devoted to preserving some small portion of what we have taken for granted for so long within reach of your arm. Dar isn't here to answer that question for you. He is here to put the question to you in the hope that you will find the answer for yourself. But understand this, we must grieve before we can act. Dar Jamal is a hero of mine. I don't have very many, not anymore, but there is one. He is among many other very special things, the kind of journalist we desperately need today. An illegal war, go. Smell the smoke, see the bodies left in the rubble where they fell. Melting glaciers, go. Put your hand in the meltwater. Dying seas, go. Touch the funeral rod of algae on dead coral, full in the knowledge that the dying has only just begun. To see, to touch, to taste is to know. Dar Jamal has seen and touched and tasted the climate of this world from one side of it to the other, even as it crumbled before his eyes. I believe Rachel Carson would be appalled by and deeply proud of the work he has done. Ladies and gentlemen, it is my great honor to introduce my friend, Dar Jamal. Thank you, Bill. I intentionally, Will had sent me that introduction uh, in advance and I intentionally waited to hear it tonight, so let me catch my breath. Thank you, Will, brother. Also, thank you to the Lannan Foundation. It was, uh, I was just thinking earlier, it was just a little bit over three years ago that I was in residency in Marfa for three months writing the introduction to this book, trying to find the voice of this book. Uh, and then the Landon Foundation generously supported the book in other ways along the journey as well. And here we are tonight. So a big thank you to the Landon Foundation. <clears throat> and also I'd like to thank my publisher, The New Press. It was an absolute joy working with them for this book. Uh, I would also like to acknowledge that we are on indigenous land and thank the local people for their thousands of years of stewardship of this land. <clears throat> I'm speaking with you tonight having come to the end of what has been a very long journey. It's a, it's a journey that began in Alaska back in 1996. I had been up there the year before. I went up there just to see the state, and the second my eyes found Denali, it was love at first sight. I, a year later, I had dropped everything and moved up there just to learn how to mountaineer so I could be up in those places. And it's really in that way that I, I then started working as a, a, a climbing guide and then uh, uh, a, a, a volunteer rescue ranger with the National Park Service on Denali. And uh, it, it's when I was up there during the buildup to the war in Iraq, literally on my tent at uh, 14,200 camp, listening to the BBC broadcasts each evening of the invasion and occupation of that country. And I was disgusted and revolted by what I was hearing. But there was a truth happening, and I knew it. I had been reading the proper media and media from abroad, and knew the whole thing was a charade, a big, bloody, disgusting, vile charade. And I knew I needed to see it for myself, and so I decided to send myself to Iraq. I followed a thread that had started pulling on my heart while I was up in the mountains. And uh, I didn't really know for sure what it was. It was a crazy thing to do, that's for sure. Um, but I wouldn't have heard 
that thread or felt it had I not been in the mountains and been in them for as long as I had. So I went to Iraq, as Will said, and I reported, and I reported, and I reported, and it was a crash course in what it was like to be a journalist telling a truth, telling truths that people did not want to hear. Even a lot of the media on the left didn't want to hear a lot of what I was reporting. I cite some of the horrors that I saw in Fallujah and that I reported. Uh, American snipers intentionally shooting women, intentionally shooting pregnant women, intentionally shooting the elderly, intentionally targeting ambulances, intentionally shooting 14-year-old boys right between their legs. All of this repeatedly for weeks. The various war crimes, the illegal weapons used, we did not want to hear about this back home. We did not want to hear about this and so much else. And another uh, thing I want to share that happened to me a couple of different times in Iraq, I like many Americans, couldn't afford health insurance, so I didn't have health insurance the whole time I was reporting from there. But when I was in Iraq, given that they had socialized medicine, two different times I got sick. One in Baghdad, and I went into the hospital, show my ID, my American passport, treated, taken well care of, sent out, uh, uh, and made well. And then later, in Fallujah, while I was reporting on some of those things that I just talked about, I got violently sick from some bad water and bad food because the city had been cut off, no water, no electricity for weeks. And in the clinic where I was reporting on, on Iraqis being brought in, uh, I was horribly sick. And one of the Iraqi doctors, again, walked away from a table treating people bleeding out and walked outside and gave me pills and told me how to take them and treated me. So I had, I had that kind of care in Iraq given to me by the people who in the corporate media were referred to as the barbar barbarians. And so it made sense to me then that the things I was reporting back here, those atrocities that I mentioned, it made, made each of us really look at who are the barbarians, who was paying for the barbarians to be there. But then again, we just needed to ask Native Americans about that. Now, years later, much of this is accepted as fact. Maybe not the details I shared, but it's common knowledge now that upwards of a million Iraqis have been killed and counting from that disaster. But now I'm having a similar experience with human-caused climate disruption and my reporting on it. Back in Alaska in 1996, uh, I, I knew where this was going straight away. You couldn't live in Alaska. The Arctic is warming twice as fast as the rest of the planet. And you couldn't live up there without being slapped in the face. Having Christmases go by in Anchorage with, with no snow on the ground, uh, the, the retreating of the glaciers that I went to each year to, to climb on, uh, the, the evidence was right in front of our eyes and there was no denying it. So it was abundantly clear even then we were already in big trouble. In 2013, I wrote an article for Tom Englehart's website uh, on tomdispatch.com where I had really, for the first time after a few years of in-depth climate reporting, connected all the dots and really got, we are in big trouble. The title of the piece was, Are We Already Off the Climate Precipice? And I saw that we had already set in motion numerous feedback loops that were irreversible and other things happening that really spelled a very dismal future for all of us. And we were likely already off the cliff. So fast forward a little bit, I had by those articles and then more to follow in the wake of that, I had essentially been doing research for my book, The End of Ice. And so I knew what was happening. And so again, I felt that pull uh, to go back out to the front lines, to send myself to where the crisis was the most obvious. And so again, I followed that thread that was pulling on my heart, uh, a, a thread that again, I'd, I'd felt from my time up in the mountains. And so I, I knew in my head, I had all the data, I knew all the studies, I, I had the information, but just like in Iraq, 
going out there firsthand, it was a completely different experience. And again, just like in Iraq, each place I went to, I had to get used to having my heart broken over and over and over again. And my hope tonight is to bring you out with me to a couple of these places so that you can share that experience. Because I'm here tonight to tell you, we are out of time. And I wish that none of this was true. I grieved in the field, and I grieve every time I talk about what's happening to the planet now. But here we are together at this time in history, and we're going to get to go through this together, like it or not. So thank you in advance for opening up to something that could likely be the hardest thing you've had to do in your life. And none of this going forward is going to be easy. This book gave me tremendous privilege to go out to these amazing places on this planet with some of the most incredible scientists studying these places. People who had literally devoted their lives to, to learning more about this part of the planet that they love so much and uh, doing their work, most of them in hopes of, of uh, taking care and preserving this place. So the first place I want to take you to is a, a brief visit to the Amazon rainforest. A little bit of specifics about this place for those who might not have heard all of this. It's two-thirds the size of the United States, the contiguous 48 states. It's the largest rainforest in the world. It generates half of its own rainfall and contains 20% of the world's rivers. The Amazon River alone has 11, I'm sorry, 1,100 tributaries, 17 of those longer than 1,000 miles. There's thousands of species of trees, 2.5 million species of insects, thousands of species of birds, 3,000 species of fish in the Rio Negro alone. New species are being discovered all the time. I spoke with one scientist there who was part of an expedition that had gone into the field with uh, a couple of dozen other scientists for 25 days to a remote area of the rainforest. In that one expedition alone netted 80 new species, frogs, fish, insects, etc. So I had an even greater privilege of getting to go to Camp 41, uh, one of several camps, the most famous of several camps, founded by Dr. Thomas Lovejoy. He's often referred to as the godfather of biodiversity. He's been studying the Amazon since 1965. He was head of the World Wildlife Fund for 14 years. He was on the White House Science Council, obviously not this one. <laughs> and so we set up the trip and we flew into Manaus, a uh, big city, about two and a half million people in the middle of the rainforest. And we kind of staged from there. And we hopped, we piled, several of us from around the world piled in Jeeps with he and several other scientists going in to work at the camp meeting others that were already there. We take a long, bumpy Jeep ride on these sort of wet, moist clay roads, sliding all over, very bumpy, uh, very good drivers, thankfully. Um, several hours later, we arrive uh, at the head of this little trail going down into the jungle. We all get out, stretch, get the creeks out of our backs, and then Dr. Lovejoy goes running down this trail. And we get our backpacks and we start walking down this trail single file. And here's this guy, one of the most prestigious scientists on the planet. I mean, his, if you look at his life work, it's just amazing. I highly recommend it. And he had gone down there and just posted up at the base of the trail simply so that he could just sit there. And each one of us, when we walked down the trail, he just stopped, looked us in the eye, you know, thank you, said our name, said thank you for coming to see this place. Thank you for taking some time out of your busy life to come see this amazing place. And then again with each of the person, each, the next person coming through. And in the camp, it's basically a small clearing in the jungle. You, you walk out the trail and over here is a tin roof and under, there's no walls anywhere. There's hammocks strung up with mosquito netting. Go grab a hammock, throw your backpack in it. Over here is a couple of picnic tables where you're going to have your meals. Over here is hammocks where the scientists sleep. And that's about it. And, uh, but I only spent a few days there 
but I immediately started having a profound experience of, of what it was like to be in the Amazon rainforest. And anyone in the audience who's been there, I, I am sure is gonna relate to this, where it literally felt like the Amazon just starts pulling you into it. And so from the first night there, it working its way into my dreams, having very, very amazing dreams, some of them a bit disconcerting, but literally feeling this change happening inside my being, and then being awakened at first light by the roar of troops of howler monkeys echoing through the jungle, coming through the camp, and then scientists saying, it's, it's okay, they're not coming for you, they're just howler monkeys. Um, and then getting up and grabbing binoculars and going out to look at birds, going through the jungle with experts, learning about trees and vines, and just being really amazed. And then a deep bonding that just naturally started to form with these people from around the world, from India, from Europe, from the United States, from Brazil, all of us there really kind of becoming one, just by the simple fact of planting ourselves right in the middle of the most amazing rainforest on the planet. And while I was there, I met a, a man named Vitek Jiranek. Uh, he's, a, he, he's from the Czech Republic, and he's worked in 11 different wildlife research positions around the world. And he was getting his PhD in ornithology from Louisiana State University. And he, uh, I started talking with him, very upbeat about his work. And speaking of Tom, Lovejoy in the most glowing terms, talked of him as though he was some sort of a, a god almost. Uh, he just couldn't say enough complimentary things about Dr. Lovejoy and was just kept touching his heart and just how honored and privileged he was. He said, it was a dream for me to be working in Camp 41 here with Tom Lovejoy. And, um, but then we started talking about climate impacts on what he was seeing and uh, his tone uh, became a bit somber. Uh, when we talked about his research, and I'm going to just read a short bit, quote, island biogeography is no longer an offshore enterprise. It has come to the mainland. It's everywhere. The problem of animal and plant populations left marooned within various fragments under circumstances that are untenable for the long term has begun showing up all over the land surface of the planet. The familiar questions recur. How many mountain gorillas inhabit forested slopes of the Virunga volcanoes along the shared borders of the Democratic Republic of the Congo, Uganda, and Rwanda? How many tigers live in the Sariska Tiger Reserve of northwestern India? How many are left? How long can they survive? Now there is anger in his voice. How many grizzly bears occupy, occupy the North Cascades ecosystem? a discrete patch of mountain forest along the northern border of the state of Washington. Not enough. How many European brown bears are there in Italy's Abruzzo National Park? Not enough. How many Florida panthers in Big Cypress Swamp? Not enough. How many Asiatic lions in the forest of Gur? Not enough. How many injury in the Alamazotra? Not enough. And so on. The world is broken into pieces now. Just before getting to go in there, as I said, we had based out of Manaus. And when I was there, I got to meet another truly incredible scientist with the perfect name. Her name's Dr. Rita Mosquita. <laughs> Uh, had co-authored books and studies with Dr. Lovejoy. He was also a biologist and researcher with the largest research institute in the Amazon. And we met in the middle of Manaus. And uh, I want to now share about uh, a little bit about um, my time with her and how it went into what became a, a rather personal interview. We. We had walked around a forest fragment that was in Manaus that she would take people on nature walks in and her eyes would sparkle and light up whenever she talked about the Amazon and just was a, data, a walking database of, of, of information about what was happening there. But then after that, we, we went into a small room and sat down and, and um, had a more personal interview. 
Mesquita explains why it's so important to take care of the Amazon basin. Quote, it is the pump, the heart of the world, she says. All the major air flows come through here. Air travels all the way from Europe and Africa and converges as it enters the central Amazon. She's particularly concerned about direct human impacts, such as clear cutting for farming. Rates of deforestation across the Amazon are increasing, and Brazil has the highest rate of assassinations related to environmental and land agrarian reform globally. By 2016, activists were being killed at a rate of nearly four people every single week worldwide. Brazil saw the highest rates with 49 killings, many of them in the Amazon, where timber industry production has been linked to 16 of these murders as deforestation rates have risen by a staggering 29%. Mesquita is determined to stop the deforestation, but she admits that this alone will not be enough. What Brazil is doing in the name of mining and industrial agriculture is mind-bending. We are trashing our protected areas, she says. She sees the world questioning conservation and jeopardizing all the victories that have been achieved in setting aside land. I work hard for conservation, she says, but I lose sleep over wondering if I'm wasting my life. Am I wasting my life? Is this a lost cause? I keep doing it because it's the only thing I know to do. She says she doesn't believe she and her colleagues are doing their jobs with the urgency needed. We are not telling the general public what is really going on, she says. Having co-edited a book with Lovejoy and authored many peer-reviewed scientific papers, Mesquita is a force to be reckoned with, but she personally feels inadequate when looking at the bigger picture. It is clear to her that we are nowhere near where we need to be. I have zero pride in all my papers because we are preaching to the converted, she says. What I want to do is talk to the outside world. I want to be able to just talk to people and tell them what is actually happening. We need to educate people about what is really going on with climate disruption. Like so many of the experts I've spoken with for this book, Mosquito believes the root cause of climate disruption is humanity's lack of connection to the planet. Even here in Manaus, kids don't understand that they live in the Amazon, she says. So there is no, con co no connection at all with anything, and that is the problem. There is sadness in her voice as she tells me this. I made a personal decision to not have kids because I don't have a future to offer them. I don't think we are going to win this battle. I think we are really done. Tropical rainforests already are so degraded that instead of absorbing emissions, they are now releasing more carbon annually than all the traffic in the United States. In 2010, a drought in the Amazon released as much CO2 as the total annual emissions of Russia and China combined. 1.5 acres of rainforest are lost every second. At some point in the not so distant future, the Amazon will regularly emit more carbon than it absorbs, yet another critical tipping point for the planet. Uh, I want to share briefly part of a conversation I had with Dr. Lovejoy before we leave the Amazon. Uh, it was towards the end of the trip, and we sat down for a long interview at the picnic tables, and uh, we had a conversation about tipping points and uh, possible extinctions and things like this. And he, he brought up some important points that I just wanted to remind some folks of. There are reasons other than moral concerns for, for protecting the Amazon, including self-interest. Quote, we go to the doctor and the pharmacy and we have no clue where our drugs came from, Lovejoy says. More of that is from nature than we realize. He mentions a poison found in the Amazon that led to the production of the pharmaceutical captopril, which in turn has become one of the first ACE inhibitors and is now used by hundreds of millions of people to control their blood pressure and heart conditions. Captopril widens blood vessels, making it easier for the heart to pump blood through them. Most of the people taking it have no idea that this drug responsible for their health is from the Amazon. He mentions another example a vine found by indigenous people. When they threw it in a lake, 
all the fish came to the surface gasping for air, which made their fishing much easier. The name of the substance that causes this is curare. It is used today as a muscle relaxant during major abdominal surgeries. His point is that if we continue to destroy the Amazon at our current pace, we may never know how it could help save millions or possibly billions of human lives in the future. Lovejoy believes this is one of the least appreciated aspects of biodiversity. Quote, the Amazon is a gigantic library of the life sciences which is continually acquiring new volumes, he says. We are discovering new species of birds all the time. And wrapped up in the middle of that is incredible adaptation capacity. It's important to remember each species represents a set of solutions to a set of biological problems. And any one of those can turn out to revolutionize how we understand biological science. Lovejoy pauses and gazes admiringly at the jungle surrounding the camp, then turns back to me. We are so stuck on ourselves, we don't think we need any of it, he says. We think we are some godlike thing. Next, I'd like to take you to the Great Barrier Reef in, off the coast of Australia. It's 1,400 miles long. It's the single largest reef on Earth. It's home to more than 1,500 species of fish, six of the world's seven species of threatened marine turtles, 30 marine mammals, 134 species of sharks and rays, 411 types of hard coral, and one-third of the world's soft corals. Just before going there, as part of the chapter in my book where I investigated what's happening to reefs globally, I had stopped through Guam en route, and there I met with Professor Lori Raimondo. She's a professor at the University of Guam Marine Lab and had lived there since 2004. She's also a co-author of the 2016 Paris Climate Agreement. So I was talking with them about the phenomena of coral bleaching. For those who don't know, a quick crash course on coral bleaching, color gets its amazing, I'm sorry, coral gets its amazing color from uh, the, the, uh, um, the uh, uh, organism that attaches itself to it where it gets its protein. And that only happens within a certain temperature range. If it gets too warm, that, uh, that uh, biological organism where the coral gets its nutrition becomes toxic and the coral will eject it. And when that happens, the coral turns bone white, hence the term coral bleaching. And it can exist that way for three to four weeks. If the water cools back down, it can bring that life back to it and start living again. But if, it, if that does not happen, then the coral will literally die. And that's the phenomenon of coral bleaching. And this, as the planet warms and as the ocean warms, that is now starting to happen uh, with regularity all around the planet like it has never done so before. And so uh, I want to share a little bit about my conversations with, with her around this phenomena. She says that warmer waters over longer periods could well bring more disease-carrying bugs to the coral, in addition to causing bleaching and more bleaching, or at least extend the lives of the bugs already attacking the coral that wasn't happening before, and their ability to damage the coral, but this still requires a lot more research. Meanwhile, the water continues to warm at an astonishing pace, and at least in the United States, budgets for scientific research on climate disruption are being slashed to the bone. Raimondo had been monitoring water quality, coastal development, overabundance of crown of thorn starfish that can decimate reefs, and overfishing over the last full decade. These have all caused coral loss, but these elements have stabilized. But then she said, but warming water has all of a sudden exploded, and the bleaching in the history of anyone looking at this, we've never had bleaching events as severe as the last couple of years. She sees the massive problems besetting Guam's reefs as a confluence of two large bleaching events in a row, followed by low tide exposure of corals for successive months, then a coral disease outbreak in 2016. Quote, we don't know how many populations that affected, but there are at least two that we know of 
that have a disease that just wipe them out in one week. We don't know what causes a lot of these. Some flare up, the coral gets stressed, maybe from the heat, and something that wasn't necessarily a problem then becomes a problem. In 2011, the U.S. National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration released a report warning that at current trajectory of atmospheric warming, CO2 emissions, and uh, oceanic warming, uh, the report warned that it was possible that there would no, be no more functional coral reefs anywhere on the planet by the year 2050. Of course, since then, uh, all of those aspects adding to this problem have increased and accelerated dramatically. But when I was speaking with each of these scientists working on this chapter, I brought up that report to uh, get their take on it. And here's what uh, Professor Raimondo had to say about it. She says, the study is evidence that pristine reefs around the world are no longer going to be areas of protection against oceanic heating since it's now a global phenomena. Quote, we're finding that reefs living under anthropogenic stresses for many years have already lost their more sensitive coral species, she says, and the ones that are there now are already the tough bastards. And when reefs have lowered diversity, there is less ecological redundancy. Hence, they are more likely to collapse. She believes that Guam's reefs carry a message for the world. The Chamorro people, the indigenous people of the Mariana Islands, including Guam, have a strong cultural affinity with the reefs and the fish they provide. Loss of the reefs would mean a critical loss of identity for the Chamorro. These are reefs that thousands of people use for fishing or cultural identity and recreational use, she says, and these are all going to be significantly threatened. The year before I spoke with her, Guam had seen 1.5 million visitors, with the majority of them tourists attracted to the crystal clear water and beaches. Quote, people coming here are going to know structure versus rubble, color versus no color, fish versus no fish, Raimondo says. Over time, all that is going to go away if there is no coral and there are no fish. So, very shortly after that, I made my way to Australia, which was at that time in 2017 under extreme heat wave. Uh, heat records were being broken all over the place, droughts, wildfires. This was 2017, even though, of course, the same exact thing just happened and is happening as we speak. I went there to meet with uh, actually a couple of people, one an American, one an Australian. The American's name is John Rumney. And he's a salty American waterman, uh, a very trim, with a gray beard, uh, uh, very, very sparkly eyes. You get John talking about the reef, and I hope you have some time. He's going to talk to you about it uh, until you have to go. He's completely in love with it. Uh, he kind of like my experience with Denali. He said, I went over, I'd read about the reef, and I went over to Australia. And the first time I got out there and saw it, I knew I had to live here and spend as much time out here as I could. Uh, he, the, he had lived there in Australia for nearly half a century, and he had started a group called Great Barrier Reef Legacy with an Australian marine scientist named Dean Miller. And the whole goal of Great Barrier Reef Legacy is these men feel uh, not enough people, uh, divers, tourists, uh, uh, otherwise, but especially scientists are getting out on the reef to really see what's happening. These guys were seeing it. They were very concerned, very afraid, very worried, and they knew we need more public attention to this. They believed, uh, like many of us have, I think at some point, that if more people really understood what was happening, maybe something for the better could happen, if for a change for the better could happen. Um, so I, I went out with these guys, and, and we, we took a full day and went to several different locations around the reef uh, so that they could show me what was happening. So I'd like to share a little bit of that with you now. After about an hour, after one stop, we climbed back into the boat, which then took us a short way to a site Rumney refers to as snow, which was right near the outer reef. This is an area where it drops down about 6,000 feet into the depths. So one would think it would be a more pristine area because of the cooler water coming up from uh, below, uh, staving off potential bleaching events. 
Rumney's excited to get into the water. This area used to be at 110% wellness, he says, smiling as he pulls on his gear. I know that's not real scientific to say, but we used to have life growing atop life here. But this area was also impacted last year, so I'm curious to see what condition it's in today. We slip into the clear water, snorkel a short way over to the shallower reef area, and I'm taken aback by the decimation. At least half of the coral is already dead, covered in slimy algae or bleached white. At one point, I swim for five minutes straight and see nothing but dead or bleached coral. I look over at Rumney. He had raved about this spot, but I'm unable to find an area that isn't at least in part bleached, dead, or covered in algae. Even the deeper areas, many of which remain largely intact, still have signs of bleaching. During a visit to the reef in 1996, I'd taken part in a liveaboard scuba diving trip across the reef. Compared to what I'd seen then, there were notably, was notably less coral in many areas, and as in Palau, another island group I had visited, far fewer fish. I swim on. The coral scape still holds an austere beauty. Fill in the vibrant colors and add myriad fish of all species and sizes, and you'd have what it used to be. I swim along in dismay. The odds are low I'll return to Australia anytime soon, and since it is unlikely to survive another 13 years, I'm effectively saying goodbye to the Great Barrier Reef. Back on the boat, Miller says, it's at least half gone, even way out here. We eat lunch while the boat motors to the third site, which Rum Rumney refers to as Mojo. I slip into the water alone, just wanting one-on-one -on -one time with the reef. Thankfully, this site is in comparatively good shape. The colors of the coral shimmer, schools of fish abound. Giant underwater islands of coral stretch tens of feet towards the surface, with coral growing atop coral, life growing on life. Giant blue stag coral grows straight out of 10-foot wide brown table coral. It is stupendous. The water crackles with the sounds of fish biting coral and the clicking sounds of shrimp. Yet even here I come across dead zones. As I enter one, my surroundings fall silent. The bottom holds larger swaths of long dead stag coral covered in slimy deep brown algae. Conscious that my time on the reef is limited, I swim out of the dead area and find another vibrant area. I stay there alone, soaking it all in. I feel time slipping away. Giant clams, anemone, table corals growing atop table corals, sponges, starfish, hard and soft corals, all the colors of the spectrum fill the water. My heart swells and I never want to leave. I dive down deep, holding my breath as long as I can until I become lightheaded, then surface again for more air. I do it again, swimming down 20, 30, 40 feet in places, equalizing my ears as I dive two, three, four times as I swim downward so I can be among the coral, the bigger fish, and the occasional reef shark. I get to be part of their world for those rare, precious, magical moments. Finally, I hear the faint sound of the horn from the boat sig signaling us to return aboard so we can head back to land. By the end of the 2017 bleaching event that I was witnessing firsthand, some scientists said the Great Barrier Reef was damaged beyond repair and could no longer be saved. Others declared the reef to be in its, quote, terminal stage. A plan by the Australian government to protect the reef was deemed, quote, no longer achievable. The year 2017 ended up being the hottest year ever recorded for Earth's oceans, making that year and the four before it the top five hottest years on record. Since that time, each successive year has been the hottest year on record for the oceans, including last year. That 2017 bleaching event, 30% of the reef that bleached died. 2018, another bleaching event, 20% of that coral died. Right now, as I mentioned earlier, Australia is um, amidst a record-breaking heat wave. January was the hottest January ever recorded, and so brace yourselves for an onslaught of news stories about what's going to be happening to the Great Barrier Reef uh, this month and next month and the following month. And uh, it's probably not going to be there in totality or much left of it at all within 10 years from right now.
it's now far too late to avert a global environmental catastrophe. 2018 was the fourth warmest year ever recorded, with the only warmer years being 2015, 2016, and 2017. We're currently in the middle of what is on track to be the warmest decade since record keeping began. We're already in the sixth mass extinction that industrial civilization has caused, injecting CO2 into the atmosphere at a rate 10 times faster than what occurred during the Permian mass extinction event 252 million years ago that annihilated 90% of life on Earth. Our current extinction rate is 1,000 times faster than normal and is faster than that of the Permian mass extinction, which is also known as the Great Dying. But today, similar to Iraq, people don't want to know these hard truths. The business as usual economic paradigm continues and there is nothing to indicate it is going to change in the radical way necessary to maybe bring about even just a little bit of mitigation. But the denial is not just in industry, it's not just in the right, on the right wing. We have our own versions on the left. The drama around the UN report that came out in the fall saying we have 12 years left to make the radical changes necessary to avert global climate catastrophe ignoring the fact there was not one new piece of data in that report whatsoever, ignoring the fact that the IPCC is heavily conservative and consistently their worst case future projections have not kept a pace with reality, with observational reality. Another example would be the new Green Deal. In 10 years, we can do this. We can still maintain a green economy, things like this. Maybe we're hoping for the 2020 election. Maybe there'll be a change for the better. Or maybe geoengineering, that's it. Maybe technology will save us. Or maybe we can keep kicking the can down the road, 2100, because that's when the worst effects are going to start happening, right? Or maybe Bernie Sanders is going to save us. Or maybe drawdown plans or things like this. None of these take into account that we're already off the cliff. Every single one of them is an attempt to try to fix something that is unfixable. The oceans have absorbed 93% of all the heat humans have added to the atmosphere. To give you an idea of how much energy that is, if they hadn't absorbed that heat, our atmospheric temperature today globally would be 97 degrees Fahrenheit hotter right now. How are you going to remove that heat from the oceans? Today's carbon dioxide levels at 412 parts per million are already in accordance with what historically brought about a steady state temperature of 7 C higher. We're just waiting for the Earth to catch up to the harms that have already been done to her. The oceans are now literally overheating, deoxygenating, and acidifying. Insects are essential for the proper functioning of all of Earth's ecosystems. They're food for other creatures, pollinators, and recyclers of nutrients. Without insects, humans cannot survive. A recent series of studies informs us there will be no more insects within 100 years at the current rate of trajectory of loss, which is 2.4% a year, assuming there is no acceleration. No more insects within 100 years. Assuming there is no more acceleration. Since just 1970, 60% of all mammals, birds, fish, and reptiles are gone. What would we call it if there had been a 60% reduction of humans since just 1970s? The IPCC's worst case temperature scenario is 4 to 5 C by 2100. Meanwhile, bearing in mind what I had just said about them, the International Energy Agency stated that preserving our current economic paradigm virtually guarantees a 6 C rise in Earth's average temperature before 2050. Shell and BP analysts expect the globe to be as much as 5 C warmer by mid-century. The piece I wrote for Tom Dispatch that I mentioned earlier called Are We, Clim Are we Falling Off the Climate Precipice? Even then, it was already clear that we were heading off that precipice. Today, six years later, a sober reading of the latest climate change science indicates that we are now 
genuinely in free fall. We are now in a nonlinear situation of climatic disruptions and their effects. We are locked into a course of uncontrollable levels of climate disruption, bringing starvation, destruction, mass migration, disease, and war. There can no longer be any question that life as we know it is ending. Now, do you, do you feel this feeling right now? This is the feeling that I've been living with for the last six years. Every day. What do we do with all of this? How are we to be facing the very real possibility of even our own extinction? How do we hold all this information and live our lives each day? I serve the earth by writing this book, and the earth took care of me all the way through it, bringing many people and many lessons into my life. It brought me a Native American elder named Stan Rushworth. One of the things that Stan reminded me of was the difference between rights versus obligations. So the settler colonialist mentality that is dominant in this country is we have rights. What are my rights? But indigenous mindset is more of our obligations, not what are they, we know what they are. The obligation to take care of and be a steward of the earth and the obligation to serve future generations, to do everything possible to take care of future generations. Are we not morally obliged to do everything possible to serve and protect the earth no matter what? No matter how bad things may get and no matter how bleak the future may appear. Czech dissident writer and statesman Václav Havel said, hope is not the conviction that something will turn out well, but the certainty that something is worth doing no matter how it turns out. It's very hard to see how humans are going to make it through this, what's coming. But we don't know for sure. We can't say that they won't. We are in a hospice situation with much of life on Earth, including possibly our own species. Yet given that we've never been here, we don't know what's going to happen. Hence, again, no matter how bleak things may appear, are we not morally obliged to serve the Earth to take care of the earth and to serve the future generations. Each of us has our own calling. I'm not here to tell anybody what to do. Each of our answers have to come from deep inside ourselves individually. And my experience has shown me if someone comes up and tries to tell you what they think you should do or we should do at this moment in history uh, because they know what has to happen to fix this, uh, move on. For me, my obligations look like this. I wake up, I ask, how can I best serve the planet today? I get quiet and I listen. And as long as I listen close enough or long enough, the answers always come. The second thing I do is something I've been doing since I moved up to Alaska in 1996. I go out into, the, into nature regularly, usually into the mountains, my preference, to connect in to see and to love her, to keep perspective, to remember why I'm here, to remember what I am in service to, and most importantly, to listen. Stan Rushworth uh, shared with me a story of his elder, Daryl Wilson, who is from the Pitt River Nation of Northeast California, a story that I'd like to uh, share with you in conclusion tonight. This is an old story that was told by East Alt writer and storyteller Dr. Daryl Wilson, who was born into Achiwawi and Atsugui Native American tribes, often called the Pit River Nation of Northeastern California. Wilson tells of Mis Misa, a small but powerful spirit that inhabits Akuyet, Mount Shasta, located in the southern end of the Cascade Range of, the North, Central, of, of North Central California. Mis Misa is a spirit force 
that balances the earth with the universe and the universe with the earth. Wilson says that Akuyet is, quote, the most necessary of all the mountains upon earth. For Mis Misa keeps the earth the proper distance from the sun and keeps everything in its proper place when wonder and power stir the universe with a giant yet invisible canoe paddle. Mis Misa keeps the earth from wandering away from the rest of the universe. It maintains the proper seasons and the proper atmosphere for life to flourish as earth changes seasons on its journey around the sun. The mountain, the story tells us, must be worshipped because Mis Misa dwells deep, in, deep within it. To climb the mountain with a pure heart and with real resolve and to communicate with, quote, all of the light and all of the darkness of the universe is to place your spirit in a direct line from the songs of Mis Misa to the heart of the universe. While in this posture, the spirit of man, woman, is in perfect balance and harmony, end quote. For as long as Mis Misa's instructions are followed with sincerity, society will be sustained. Its inhabitants will survive for the long term. Quote, the most important of all the lessons, it is said, is to be so quiet in your being that you constantly hear the soft singing of Mis Misa. However, the story also warns that by not listening to Mis Misa's song, the song will fade. Mis Misa will depart, Quote, and the earth and all of the societies upon earth will be out of balance and, the, and life therein vulnerable to extinction. I've always wondered why I'd been so drawn to the siren song of the mountains. And when Stan told me this, this story last June, I finally knew why I was always pulled so far up into them. It's where I go to listen to the earth. And it was in that listening that I heard the call to first go to Iraq and then the call to do this book. And it's in that listening that my life has been changed forever. So I'd like to leave you with two questions to think about for after you leave here. Where do you go to listen to Mis Misa? And when was the last time that you went there to listen? When was the last time that you went there to listen? Thank you.